Good afternoon. My name is Alex Klokas, and I'd like to welcome you to the Future of Learning track here at the 2019 World Government Summit. As we continue to discuss the biggest issues plaguing our society today, there is no better place to start than education. UNESCO estimates that the global poverty rate could be reduced by more than half if all adults completed secondary education. By 2022, the World Economic Forum estimates that no less than 54% of all employees will require significant re- or upskilling. And finally, they estimate that 33 to 65% of children entering kindergarten today will ultimately end up working in new jobs that don't exist yet. So how do we prepare our children for this uncertain future? Our first speaker is Dr. Shafali. Dr. Shafali is an advocate for lifelong learning that is supported by conscious parenting. She believes that if you give your children a normal education, they will earn a degree. But if you instill in them a conscious belief that they must keep learning, they will learn their whole life and become resilient to the evolution of the workplace. Join us in this session as we welcome Dr. Shafali to the stage. Hello, everyone. Oh, you have to be friendly, OK? Because this standing here alone is quite intimidating. So you have to be friendly. You have to talk back to me. You have to make me feel at ease. So I leave feeling better. I don't care about you. You have to let me feel better. Yes? How are you? OK, I've got a quiz for you. Are you ready? What's one thing we all have in common? What? A phone? <laughs> well, our cell phones, yes. Our extra hand. What's something else we all have in common? A brain? Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know if all of us have one. Consciousness? Don't know if everyone has consciousness. A desire to be happy, yes. Very good. Love. No, but, but maybe not everyone has the same desire to be happy. Not everyone has the same capacity to love. What is something we all have in common? Come on. Somebody said it. We all had or have parents. So that means we all were once children. We are still children. Just looking all grown up with a phone, looking fancy. We were all once children, yes? So if we were all once children, then with it comes feelings. We all had feelings. Yes, this is one thing that every human has. So whether you're a parent or not, how many parents are in this room? OK, the rest of you, think really hard, OK, before you become one. Because you had a childhood, you saw how messed up it was, yes? So I'm a clinical psychologist, and I help parents remember who it is they once were. You see, the problem with us adults is that we think we're all grown up and sophisticated just because we can pay our bills and remember to tie our shoes. But that doesn't mean we're really grown up. What makes someone grown up? What? Oh, when you have kids, yes. That's when you realize how little you've grown up. That's when you realize that you are as old as a three-year-old. When your three-year-old has a tantrum, what does a parent do? We have a tantrum ourselves, yes. So I'm a clinical psychologist, and I help parents become conscious. So someone said that they already believe that they are conscious, and I humbly disagree. 
We're not conscious. We just know how to see and smell and touch. So we have five senses, but we're not conscious. To be conscious is to be aware that in every moment, you are bringing an emotional legacy, an emotional feeling, an emotional touch, taste, an emotional taste. That's why I said our feelings and our childhood is the most common. To every moment, we bring our feelings. You're not aware of this, but you're bringing your energy to every moment. When you become aware of this energy and start being aware, because it's impossible to be fully aware, you begin being conscious. So when you become a parent, if you are unconscious, you raise your children unconsciously, yes? How many of you think you were raised unconsciously? You're less scared to admit, but if you go to your therapist, she'll tell you you were raised unconsciously. And the reason most of us were raised unconsciously is because our parents didn't know any better. They didn't understand what it means to be conscious. So when you become a conscious parent, you begin to realize that you're putting on your child all the things that... What do you put on your child? Your own experiences, yes? So when you have a child and you're unconscious, you put on the child your own feelings, your own experiences, your own ideas. That's what our parents did to us. They raised us in the mirror of their own ideas, their own beliefs. If they believed the sky was red, you would believe the sky is red. And many of us grew up believing things only because our parents believed them. So you and I think we have free will. You're sitting here thinking, I have free will. I chose to come to this room. I didn't go to that room. I'm so smart. I have so much power. But you don't realize that in your mind is a tape. And who created the tape? Your parents. And guess what you do to your children? You give them your tape. So your child comes into the world thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be a unique human being. I'm going to be a free bird. I'm going to fly the limitless sky. And then the bird, the, bird, the child, look, about to be caged, looks at your eyes and you look at it and go, nope, you're not free. You are my child and you're going to bear my name and you're going to carry my tradition and you're going to wear my dress and you're going to believe in my God. Nothing wrong with that. But... What if, nothing wrong, already I'm in trouble. <laughs> it's okay, I'm used to being in trouble, always in trouble. Always saying things against the norm. But let's, let's wait for me to warm up a little bit. Inter oh, she's like, you said we have to interact. Only if you agree with me. If you disagree, no interaction. This is how parents are. I'm just being like how every parent is. If you agree, please talk to me. Don't agree, shut up. No, not you, not you. Yeah. Yes. To push. Yes. Okay. A little bit. Let me warm up a little bit. Okay. So, so children come into the world free, yes? You came into the world once free, ready to discover who it is you uniquely are. Would you agree with that? However, we grow up in a system. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But the system decides for you who you are to be. So when I do therapy with families, good families, yes? What makes a good family? Caring. Check. They're both, so you're presuming there's two, educated. Check, check. Okay. You don't agree. <laughs> now she's, it's at least you, not me. We're just going with the flow, yeah? We're just going with the flow. Okay, what else is on the checklist? Caring, love, 
ethics. Yes. What else makes a good family? They follow the rules. They're married. They stay together. They make enough money. Yes? So you're checking the list and you're like, amazing. On the checklist, they're following what all of us were told to follow. But yet, they're sitting in my therapist, in my therapy office, and there's dysfunction. And often the dysfunction is that the two generations don't understand each other. And the child wants to be seen and heard and understood for who it is the child is. Yes? Any one of you have experienced this with an older generation? Yes. Where you die, your, your greatest yearning is to be understood for who it is you are. But the older generation can't see you because of the way things should be. So the clash between what should be and what is creates the unhappiness that brings the person to my therapy office. So the missing ingredient is not on the checklist. You can be a good family, you can follow the rules, you can be uh, well-earning, you can be living together in a long-term marriage, but the missing piece that brings somebody to therapy is the consciousness. And consciousness requires for you to see the person before you as they are. And this is the missing ingredient in education as well. When education is uniform, when it's stereotypical, when it's one size fits all, it fails to honor who it is the person truly is. And each one of you sitting here today, even if you may be dressed the same or may look the same or we're all in the same room or we came for the same agenda, each one of us has a burning desire deep inside to be recognized for who it is you uniquely are. So it is with our children. And I'm here to advocate that we reclaim that unique essence. And in order to reclaim that unique essence for our children, you need to honor it within yourself. And if you want a new tomorrow where children are changing the rules or changing the game and thinking differently, yes, we all want bold, new, risk takers, yes? You all want your children to think different, to experiment, to be adventurers, explorers. How can they do that if we put the same tape into each one? When the same tape cannot fit each child, it is impossible. But we can brainwash our children, yes? We can force them into compliance, yes? We call it discipline, yes? How many of you parents have bought a book on discipline in your lifetime? How to discipline your children, yes. So in my work, I teach that there's no such thing. That to discipline our children in the traditional way is simply to scare them, to use fear. And fear, you see, is how most of us were raised. We were raised on a diet of fear and compliance. So we teach our children to be good, otherwise they will be punished. And how do we punish our children? We have so many techniques. Come on, parents. How do we punish? So imaginative, so creative. How do we punish our children? We turn off the internet. Yeah, you don't play games. Yeah, you're like, you don't take away the phone, then the laptop. You just turn off the internet. But then you'll suffer too. That's... Ch only change, yeah, change the password. You have to think. You can't suffer. Only they must suffer. Yes. How else do you punish your children? Time out. So easy. Then what else? Face the wall. So creative. <laughs> only, only you thought of that. Yes. What else do we do to punish our children? What? Shave their head? Hair? No. <laughs> Okay, shave their hair. Never heard of that one before. For girls too or only boys? Yeah, you have to be equal opportunity. You can't be favoring only the boys. What else? Oh, give you three choices. Yeah, but what if they say eat a donut, eat an ice cream and go to a movie? 
They can't do that. So what do, what do they say? Hit me on the face, hit me on the butt, lock me in a room. So you tell them, choose, he says, I tell my children because he's so conscious. He's so conscious. He believes they should choose the punishment. So he says, you choose three, I'll choose one out of the three. I think that's fabulous. What else? How else do we punish our children? How were you punished? Does anyone have a unique way they were punished? No cinema. Okay. For a month. Shame. Ah, shame. This is the parent's ultimate tool. Shame. How do we shame our children? Give us ways that you shame your children. How were you shamed? Do you understand shame is the most common technique? All discipline is for the purpose to shame your child. Aren't we lovely people? We love shaming. We love shaming our children. How do we shame our children? We tell them that they are? They are? Bad, exactly, you're bad. And what makes a bad child? Because they don't listen to us. Yeah, why did we have children if they're not going to listen to us? We had children, why did we have children? So that they worship us, yes? They follow us. They think we are the most amazing person on earth. So when your child defies you, that's bad, correct? And, and who is a good child? Somebody who obeys you, who respects you. So even if you're talking utter nonsense, but they love you and respect you, they're a good child. The bad child, who may be really a very clever child, who's asking you questions, but why? I don't think so, mom. I think you're a hypocrite, dad. You'd call them a bad child and lock them up in the room, yes? So my point is, the way we raise our children is on a tape. And that tape is the same. You were raised on shame, I was raised on shame. You were raised with fear, I was raised with fear. You were raised with a finger that told you you're going to go to some very bad place after you die, so was I. You were told that you need to be good, quiet, follow, so was I. All over the globe, we are raised with one parenting model whose foundation is shame, guilt, fear, and obedience. Correct? Now, nothing wrong with that, okay? Nothing wrong with that. But, there's a but. The but is that when will we stop doing things the way they've always been done? When will we dare to do it differently? To think, to ask, do I dare to look at my child before me and dare to not put my tape into this brain? Do I dare to not give my script my list, you do this, you do that, you do... What are the things we put on the list before our child has even come out of the womb? What do we put on the list? Religion. First, that's a given, right? That's already a given. The name is given. The religion is given. What else do we give our child before they're even out? Nationality. And not just the nationality, that they must be loyal to the nationality, yes? How to be with the nationality. We don't just say you, you're American, we say you must love being an American. We don't just say you're a Catholic, we say, and you will be a good Catholic, right? So we, we give the, the way to be also. So the reason I'm doing this is just to have you think, yes? When I leave, don't accost me, don't attack me. I'm just making you uncomfortable for a reason. I want you to think about how you've been raised, and I want you to think about how you're raising your children. And if you want to then do it the same old, same old, do it. But I want you to go to the edge of your comfort to ask, am I doing it simply the way I've been taught? Or do I dare to do it with a courage that I've never experienced in my own life? I'm asking you to go to the edge of your comfort, yes? That's why you've come to a summit like this, to think differently, to look at things from another angle. You haven't come here, so you leave here the same, correct? You came here to be challenged. So that's what I'm doing. I'm poking you in uncomfortable places. So before they come out, you give them the religion, the nationality, your family name, your traditions, and you tell them that they must love them. 
before the child has come out, yes? And the name. Okay, then the child comes out. Then what do we tell them? Their profession. You've kind of decided. If they're a boy, they cannot be a ballet dancer, for example. Like, that would not be ideal. Correct? But a soccer player, for sure. Do you see what we do? We divide and stratify. We already tell our children who they must be. You were raised like this and I was raised. We are deeply... What is the word for this? Do you know the word? Deeply unconscious. And the process is called conditioning. You and I are not people of absolute free will. Our free will is as, as wide and expansive as, as a hair. Our actual free will. Truly, we don't have free will. Because what we're running on is a tape in our head. And the tape is deeply conditioned. You're conditioned by your family, by your parents, by your culture. And to live a conscious life means to examine it. You don't have to change it. But at least have the courage to look at it in the face and say, is this me? Is this truly me? Or am I doing it because I'm just following? Following. Because I've been raised on fear, guilt, shame and compliance. So, we give them the profession. We tell them to go to school, yes? Then what do we tell them about how to be at school? They must get A's, of course. And anything off A is a source of great anxiety for the parent, yes? Then after school, they must go to college. But for girls, like, there's a little limit, no? A little bit? Like, eventually there's a limit because they must what? Of course, get married. And then? Have kids and love it. <laughs> how, many, how many mothers here looked at their mothers and said, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> yes, I looked at my mother as if she was the biggest betrayer. I said, you didn't care to tell me? Like you just made me feel this was a rose of, like a garden full of roses. I'm just going to walk through smelling them. You refused to tell me the truth. So it is, we keep piling on the prescription list to our children, yes? We give them what we know. We only can do that. So when our children want to be different, they crave to be unique. They desire nothing more than to leave their own unique expression on their humanity. They don't need to leave it for the world, but they want to express their own humanity, their own temperament. But when the rules are so strict and the box is so tight, they have no choice. So speak not of being conscious. Speak not of progressive education. All nice words. Very nice words. If you're not willing to give up fear, guilt, shame, and compliance. But when you do give it up and you do raise a free-thinking child, it comes with a price. What is the price of a free-thinking child? What is the price? No, what is the challenge of having a free-thinking child? You, your mother must have had a challenge, right? Then you have to accept them for the way they are, and if they're nothing like you, then? Then what? They will leave, and that is the price of a f somewhat the price that all of them don't leave. But that's the price you have to be willing to bear. Is it about you or is it about your child? Are you having a child for you to just see yourself in the mirror? Because that's what we're doing. We're all having children just to feel good, to post on Facebook, look what a great thing I've produced. Look at the thing I've created. I'm a loser, but my child, amazing. Every trophy your child gets, tell me you don't post it on Facebook. But when they get a D grade or they were sent home from school, do you post it? When they vomit, do you post it? No. But when they're looking like a superstar, you catch them in that moment and post it. Why? Because you're doing this all for you. The reason we have children is for ourselves. You think you're some martyr, angel, saint for having a child. Ask your children. Your children will be like, no, my father's not a martyr, saint, angel. 
He only wants me to do what he wants me to do. So the child who grows up like this suppresses their true nature. All of us suppressed. Or we rebelled. Who here was a rebel? He was a rebel. You were a rebel. Yes. And were you very, very bad? Were you in a lot of trouble? So this is what? What is the true nature of? Exactly, but we don't allow the true nature to ever come out. The true nature is the true nature. It's, it's not a what or a quantity or a color. It is the nature of our essence. It's like saying, what is the nature of a tree? Do you know the nature of the tree? What is the nature of the willow tree to the oak tree to the rose bush? It's the nature of that rose bush, yes? Is it the same as the other rose bush? But the nature, nature is nature. Everything has life. Everything has spirit. Everything has energy, yes? If you think nature doesn't have vital energy, then you're cut off from nature. Each one of us, including nature outside, has a nature. We don't allow the nature to blossom because we're constantly putting our children in boxes. So my challenge to you today, even if you're, if you're not able to change anything, is just think, as you're putting the tape onto your children, as you put the tape onto your friends, we keep telling everyone around us how they should be. Each religion tells the other religion how to be. Each teacher tells the children how to be. The children tell the other children how to be. We all want everyone to be like us. So we suppress everybody's true nature. So my challenge to you today when you go out of here is to think, how close to my true nature, my authentic nature, do I dare to be? And how much of my authentic nature do I never show anyone? And then if you're a parent, when you go back to your children, how many of you are parents again? Raise your hands. Okay, this is my challenge to you. When you go back just for one day, okay, because you won't be able to do it tomorrow, just today, maybe for half an hour, can you look at your children as true spirits, true energy? For one time, see them without your name, without your religion, without your ideas, without your fears, without your guilt. One time, encounter them as true essence and connect with them as they truly are. In studies on education, they find that the missing piece, besides consciousness, but because there's no consciousness, the missing piece is the connection, the relationship between teacher and student. You've heard of this, that a student will learn anything if the relationship is optimal. So it is with our children. And the only way we can have a true relationship with them or ourselves or with anyone is if we bow down to the true nature of the other and we accept them for who it is they are. So you owe it to your children for 30 minutes today to see their true nature and accept them for who it is they are. And maybe if you're really bold, ask them, how is it for them to be your child? to be with the name, the tradition, the religion, already given on a prescription list? Do you even allow them to think about who they could be without that? So I leave you with this challenge. Thank you, everyone.